Okay, so welcome to this evening's talk on the Buried Bow School project, which, as you know, was a community test pitting project run by Blaby District Council in partnership with the University of Leicester Archaeological Services and funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. Um, I'm Matthew Morris, I was the project archaeologist from the University of Leicester and tonight, having spent the last month going through all the finds that you found for us, I'm going to take you through the results. So the aim of this talk is to give you a broad overview of what those results tell us. I'm not going to go through every single test pit individually. We'll be here for hours if I do that. Um, at the end of this talk is a web link to the project page on which you'll be able to download the full excavation report and delve into what you individually found within your test pit. If you can't um, find your or remember what your test pit number was, if you do a search for your name in the report, it should pop up with the test pit you were digging um, when you do a search for it. So you should be able to find which one you were digging. OK, so just to go back for, to the beginning, then, why did we want to dig in Bow School Park? Well, we wanted to make new discoveries about the past history of the area. And I, basically, that meant we wanted to establish the character, date and significance of the many earthworks in the park or more simply put, why on earth is the ground in the park so lumpy? Uh, we wanted to involve the residents of Blady in the wider area in making those discoveries. We wanted to inspire and stimulate wider interest in the history of Bow School Park and Blaby. We wanted people to have an opportunity to take part in a hands-on archaeological project, something perhaps they hadn't done before. And above all, we did want to have some fun as well, which we needed after the last year or so, of course. So the park today that we appreciate today with its specimen trees, its plantations, the fish pond, the ice house and so forth, is a very well preserved Victorian landscape park. So it dates back um, sort of 100, 180 odd years, the landscape that we can see today. And this was all linked with or part of the pleasure ground that was associated with Blaby Hall. Um, so everything we see surviving in the park was once part of that Victorian landscape surrounding the, the private landscape surrounding Blaby Hall. And we can see that on this first edition Ordnance Survey map, which is from 1886. We can see Blaby Hall at the top of the image and then with its gardens around it and then out in the wider landscape, the park itself, which is today the public park. This was all the work of John Clark, who became the new Lord of the Manor in Blaby in 1837. Clark demolished what was styled the old hall and built the new Jacobean style house that you can still see standing just outside the park today, set within extensive landscape grounds. And he, he laid those out in 1838 in a gardenesque style, which meant it sort of had formal gardens around the hall itself, separated from a more informal parkland by a ha ha. So it would look like your formal gardens sort of gently morphed into that more informal parkland landscape without the, the animals in the parkland being able to get into your formal gardens. And the recent test pitting has shown some results from the week or so produce some artifacts that we can perhaps link with the Victorian use of the park. Uh, test pit 18, for instance, out in the south, uh, southeast corner of the park, produced quite a lot of willow pattern plates from at least two different plates, for instance. Um, and then test pit 20 in the, the southwest corner of the park produced a lead carbine shot, which has probably come from Victorian game shooting in the park. Um, Close examination shows that it is slightly elongated, which tells us it has been fired, although it's got no impact um, depression. So whatever it is, it didn't hit anything. It's what's called drop shot. It's uh, something that's been fired and missed. And then we had handed in during the project from a member of the public. We had this 1844 Victoria Silver Crown, which that person had found during path maintenance in the park and had picked up off the ground. So all of these finds we can perhaps link with this Victorian use of the landscape. We also had archaeology that we can link with the park in the form of this ceramic, horseshoe-shaped ceramic land drain. 
it's probably 1850 or later in date and so it's to do with drainage works put into the park uh, this was on test pit eight in the middle of the park in that low area in the middle of the park so we can surmise that it was probably put in to help drain that low area which still today periodically floods after um, lots of wet weather so all of these finds, they're sort of what you'd expect to find in, in parkland. When we look at their distribution, it's a sort of broad scatter across the park. And they don't actually add too much more to what we already know about the park. Um, uh, the landscape that we can see today actually is the, the more revealing um, evidence for the, the park as, as that pleasure ground. And it, the way it's set out is designed to be a landscape that you experience in motion. So visitors, members, um, residents of the house, visitors to the house, they would be walking out into the park to experience select views of different um, um, signature features like the house itself through different you know, gaps in the trees and from different angles. So as you walk around the park, trees and planting masks the view and then suddenly a new view comes into sight. So it's designed to be out in and used this park. It's not just designed to be seen from the houses. It is a pleasure ground. It's, it's a recreational area. And the, the Victorian house, ice house that's been restored as part of the project, that is again one of these sort of significant features in the park. On the one hand, it's a practical structure, but on the other hand, it's a very visible structure in the parkland. You have to remember when the park was created in the 19th century, None of the mature trees that you see around the ice house today would have been there. They would have all been new planted as part of the parkland. So the ice house as an earth mound next to the pond would have been very visible. So on the one hand, you've got this as a, a um, practical structure. Um, you've got a domed brick chamber into which in the winter ice would be packed. And then during the summer months, you'd have servants accessing the the ice vault through the arched tunnel and taking ice back to the hall's kitchens to chill um, food and drinks and desserts uh, and so forth for um, parties and, and meals um, in the hall itself. And you can see that that sort of practical element, this sort of um, below stairs element to it in the way that the when you look at the Ordnance Survey map, the black arrow on here from the ice house, which is the black circular dot, shows you the route the servants would have taken through the tree belt on the edge of the park back between the ice house and the kitchens and effectively they would be going unseen but sheltered by the trees so that anyone else out in the gardens wouldn't see that activity going on but as i said it is the ice house is also a statement feature in the park when you stand on top of it and look towards the house you can see it would be the house is just behind the trees in the background it would have been very visible in the days of um, the new days of it being laid out and constructed. Anyone walking on the garden terrace would have clearly been able to see the ice house. And again, if you are actually as a resident or visitor to the house wanting to go out into the park for recreation, and particularly if you wanted to use the long walk, you'd be taking that same route that the servants took and you'd actually be walking past the ice house. So it's designed to be seen. It is a, a sign of sort of conspicuous consumption. It's, it's showing off the fact that you can afford to have a, an ice house and can afford to serve iced drinks and desserts um, during parties and receptions as well. So um, just because it has that practical um, below stairs function, it has other reasons for being where it is as well. But as I said, when you look at the distribution of finds that we can date to as modern finds, um, so anything from 1800 onwards to the present day, we get a broad scatter, not too many in each pit, but a broad scatter across the, the whole park, um, not clustering in any area or any particular pit. The one on the um, southeast here that's quite a large circle showing you there's quite a lot of finds is all the willow pattern plate that came out of um, test pit 18. So the finds themselves from 1800s to the present don't really add anything new to the story of the park that we can't glean from other sources of information. But actually that's not really what we were interested in anyway. What we were interested in was all the curious earthworks beneath that visible landscape. 
what we wanted to explore by digging holes in it was that sort of that hidden um, and un or poorly or understood landscape that's beneath the Victorian pleasure ground. There have been various suggestions of what these earthworks could be over the years. Um, it has been suggested that they are part of the, uh, an abandoned part of medieval Blaby, um, so the house platforms and gardens of um, village cottages dating to the medieval period. Um, there has been a suggestion that some of the earthworks could be the site of the original medieval manor house that Blaby Hall replaced. And there has also been a suggestion that the earthworks, the terraces, sunken areas could represent the remains of formal gardens from a much earlier phase of Blaby Hall's history, perhaps the 16th or 17th century, um, when you would, um, so the sort of Tudor Stuart period where you'd get these more formal gardens like this reconstruction at um, Kenilworth Castle. So lots of suggestions of what the earthworks could be. None of those ideas had ever been tested in the past. And so by digging test pits ourselves, we had a chance to explore these different theories. We can particularly see these earthworks because they're quite hard to understand and fully appreciate how they interact with each other when you're just walking around the park. But when you look at um, them from say a LIDAR survey, so this is a digital terrain model um, from created from aerial LIDAR, and this has been processed to remove all the trees and vegetation so we can just see the ground surface and all the different earthworks. When we look at this, we can start seeing that there are these large rectangular enclosures and lots of other linear earthworks that when we sort of break them down into their different areas, we can see on the eastern side of the park is the remains of ridge and furrow, so the remains of medieval plough systems in two different fields. We can see on the, the western two thirds of the park, then we can see that the area seems to break down into a series of rectangular enclosures. There's also what appears to be some sunken trackways running through the northern part of the park as well. And this sort of yellow striped area just comes across as very uneven on the LIDAR and as you're walking around the landscape and looks like it's been disturbed in the past for, for some reason. There's also some hints of possible ridge and furrow with beneath or within these rectangular enclosures, these red dashed lines. And then previous archaeological observations in the park, these four red stars in the southwest corner, these were archaeological discoveries made when the original path around the park was put in in the 1990s. And in this corner, cobbled surfaces, possible stone walls and 13th century pottery were all recovered from these different locations in this corner of the park. Now these rectangular enclosures, these all seem to correspond with fields or closes that we can see on the 1766 enclosure map of Blaby. So at the top of the image here, we've got Blaby Old Hall, the building that um, pre was the predecessor of the current house. And then we can see the name Major in all of these enclosures. And this is the name Thomas Major. He was the Lord of the Manor in 1766 when the village was enclosed. And the 1766 Act of Enclosure, the actual written document, specifically mentions several ancient closes and parcels of land belonging to Thomas Major or about to be given to him as part of the Enclosure Act. And it talks about them being specifically ancient closures, so it means that they're already enclosed small fields, they're not part of the open field. And they must be these fields that we can see in this image, because these are the only ancient enclosures in the enclo in, on the map that are, have Major's name on them. And we're given some names for these. They're the Peace, the Old Orchard, the Lunds, the Great North Close, the Little North Close, Bruins Lunds, and Brick Hill Close. So the 1766 maps suggest that these rectangular earthworks must have been in place before 1766, so they can't be anything to do with the Victorian landscaping. They must be a much earlier landscape. As an initial step to try and find out what might have been in them, a geophysical survey was carried out in the park in 2015. And this threw up lots of other potential archaeological features. So this is a, 
um, magnetometry survey. The sort of very dense white areas are the areas around the trees that are still standing and so they weren't part of the survey. Other areas like this big thick black line with the white band on either side of it in the southeast corner here, that is a modern pipe that is giving probably a metal pipe by the looks of it which is giving off a very big magnetic signal that is fuzzing out the land and the results to either side of it so these areas where you see these sort of big white blotches are these are probably close to something metal in the ground that is creating a interference with the survey but beneath that we can see there's lots of the blue lines and blobs all represent possible archaeological features they seem to cluster in the south west corner of the park again in this area where there have been previous archaeological observations. The red lines all represent possible ridge and furrow again and so we can see it sort of correlates with the known earthworks on the eastern side of the park but there's lots of suggestions there might be ridge and furrow as well within the eastern um, the western side of the park and then the pink and the brown areas or grey areas are areas of either geological or modern disturbance. And again, they seem to correspond with this area of uneven ground that you can see on the LIDAR survey. So this was your task. Um, we set you to dig one meter square test pits across the park to try and explore these theories and these features. And so hopefully at the end of it, we would come out with a, uh, so a new understanding of what they might be. So the project altogether, we had over 130 volunteers and local school children dig 22 test pits over seven days at the end of June and the beginning of July. Um, that was after several delays and false starts because of COVID. So it was fantastic. We finally got into the park and actually in the end, the stretching it out over six days meant we dug more test pits than we'd actually originally conceived. When we first set up this project back in early 2020, we'd actually thought over two day weekend when which was what the project was originally going to be we would dig 14 test pits so in the end we dug 22 test pits and even that was more than we'd actually initially sort of thought we would dig as well so that's a fantastic accomplishment by you the volunteers from uh, getting us that big an insight into the park so here's the distribution of those 22 test pits the distribution is semi-random in that we were targeting the earthworks and the geophysical survey, so we wanted a distribution of test pits across the park, looking at these different areas and features, but the precise location of each test pit was largely made by me on the ground on the day um, as we were marking them out based on what we could sort of visually see. So there was no sort of specific criteria for putting each test pit in exactly where it was. It was sort of me sort of instinctively putting test bits in and actually I based on the results because we were doing it over six days based on the results from previous days test bits I actually ended up doing putting in less test bits along the northern side of the park based on previous results and actually focusing more in the southwestern corner based on results coming up so that sort of explains the sort of the perhaps the uneven clustering you can see here we deliberately didn't put too many in the eastern half of the park because we can see there's ridge and furrow earthworks there so we know it's medieval plow systems and so what we were particularly interested in in was focusing on these enclosures on the western part side of the park so 22 test bits excavated that was four more than the target of 18 that we'd actually set for the six days and as i said it was eight more than we originally thought we would do each test pit was dug to an average depth of about half a meter um, that means about 10 cubic metres of soil was dug and processed or approximately 15 tonnes of soil was dug out over the six days. Um, but it's worth saying that those 22 test bits only represent 0.05% of the entire 4.8 hectare park. So the sample is minute. So any conclusions we draw from these results have to be treated with a pinch of salt. Um, we aren't looking at large areas. And we're, we're not looking at a large percentage of the park and with the distribution it could just be and the size of excavation that we have missed sort of key bits of evidence because of of the what the nature of the project but it's given us this first snapshot and insight into the park of those 22 test bits then 18 were dug to the natural 
um, which was mostly through a sequence of topsoil and subsoil to glaciogenic clay and gravel, which is the sequences you can see in the four photographs here of these test pits. These all represent the sort of the typical sequence um, that was dug during the park, um, across the park. It was sort of more or less the same um, everywhere. We had one test pit that produced this gravel instead of clay. That was test pit 10 on the western side of the park. But otherwise, we generally came down on this red or pinkish coloured um, glacial clay. Um, soils in most of the test pits are clearly re were reworked in the past, probably through a combination of agricultural and industrial winds disturbances. So what I mean by that is that ploughing, gardening and quarrying had mixed up the soil so that we had mixed assemblages of finds of all periods spread vertically throughout the sequence so that we could quite easily have modern and post-medieval material at the bottom of the pit and medieval material at the top. It was all mixed up. The other possibility is some of it could be landscape gardening from the park as well, some of this disturbance as well. Of the four test pits not dug to the natural, we stopped two because of modern disturbances of unknown depth, and I'll come on to those later. We stopped one because of the archaeological features in it, and we decided not to dig any deeper, and one just ran out of time with the time available to, um, to us and, and wasn't bottomed because of that. And six, importantly, contained archaeological features. So that's almost a sort of 27, almost 30% of the test pits had archaeological features in it, as well as finds. Every single test pit produced finds, although test pit one, I'm afraid, did only produce three finds. And test pit 14, I think, wasn't far behind that either. But every single test pit did find something, not necessarily meaningful, but archaeological which is important to say. So these features, I'll go into deep depth about them as we go through, but we had that modern land drain in test pit 8 and we had possible post-medieval quarrying going on in test pits 8 and 13. These were the two test pits that were stopped because the, of the modern disturbance we were being dug into. There was possibly a, po a co post-medieval cobbled surface in test pit 11, a possible cobbled surface in test pit 21, and a medieval cobbled surface and a possible wall in test pits five and seven, and I'll come back to those later on. Of the finds then, well, the oldest finds recovered and bagged up were not archaeological, but were um, geological. They were devil's toenails from, well, these are from test pit four. So these are the shells of extinct marine bivalve mollusks of the Mesozo Mesozoic era, so that's 252 to 66 million years ago. These are naturally occur occurring in the local glacial clay, and they're not archaeological, but as you found them, I show them. The finds, the archaeological finds, ranged in date from probably the Mesolithic period, so between 12 and 6,000 years ago to the present day. So we had everything from worked flint all the way up to the most recent datable find we had was a 1992 10 pence coin that came out of test bit 22 out of the topsoil. We also had other modern detritus from the public use of the park, things like cigarette lighters, Coca-Cola bottle lids, and this um, meter reader key from J Banks and Co which you can still buy those today as well. So it's definitely, um, I found them an order for one online so you can easily get hold of them so they're still exact same by J Banks and Co it's a modern find as well um, so that one came out of test bit 19 that particular find it's presumably again someone has lost the key in the public park it would be my guess it's fallen out of a pocket or something like that the finest distribution then, altogether out of the 22 test bits, we recovered 1,853 finds that could be considered archaeological. 20% of those came from the topsoil, so that top, two, uh, top 20 centimetres of the test pit that, if you remember during the weekend, was largely devoid of finds, and that's sort of borne out when you catalogue it. Only 20% 20 20 of the finds came from the topsoil. 53% of the finds came from the subsoil. And then 27% of the finds came from archaeological features, which is really useful because that helps date those features. These could all be broken down into categories for analysis. So we break them down into flint, pottery, clay tobacco pipe, glass metalwork, coins, building material, industrial material, animal bone, and other finds, which is all the sort of things that don't fit in those other categories like modern plastic. 
the biggest assemblage then was the building material, but this is biased by three test bits, test bits four, eight, and 13, because 73% of the assemblage of the brick building material, which was mostly brick rubble, came out of just those three test bits. And they were the three in the lower area in the middle of the park. So really the most meaningful assemblage we recovered was the pottery. So nearly 30% of the finds we recovered was pottery. Industrial material is quite high, but that is mostly charcoal and coal that was recovered. There was a little bit of iron slag and industrial sort of waste in there as well. Animal bone was a sort of reasonable quantity of it as well, mostly undiagnostic, sort of small, medium mammals. So sort of sheep, pigs, things like that. Um, possibly some bits of cow and so forth. Um, other finds though, flint, clay, tobacco pipe, glass, metalwork and so forth were quite low and would be much lower than if we'd been digging in the middle of the village because we, in this instance, we weren't digging in an area that has seen any recent occupation of it. We know for the fact that at least for the last 180 odd years, it's been grassland and um, either landscape park or public park. So there hasn't been that opportunity for a lot of more recent finds to, to get into the soil. These break down into different find, um, periods as well. Um, so we had those geological finds from the Mesozoic area. In terms of archeological finds, we had everything from, we had Mesolithic, Bronze Age, Roman, Saxo-Norman, medieval, late medieval, post-medieval and, mod and modern finds, as well as quite a large assemblage of finds of unknown date and the unknown date finds are the things like the animal bone, charcoal, coal, uh, ironwork, because you can't really, most of it's undiagnostic. Nails are just nails. You can't necessarily put a period to them. Again, the high amount of post-medieval material is again biased by the building material that came from the three test pits in the middle of the park. So again, really our dominant period of finds was the high medieval period. And you see that particularly when we just look at the pottery recovered, we can see 80, nearly 86% of the pottery recovered from the excavations was of this high medieval period. So 12th to 14th century in date with very small assemblages of Roman, Saxo-Norman, hardly any late medieval, a little bit of post-medieval and a little bit more modern pottery as well. So really we had a very tight date range for the finds we were recovering for a very specific period of history. So I'm going to take you through these chronologically then period by period to show you what the, these all these different sort of find periods and categories of finds actually tell us about the history of the park. So the three oldest finds recovered from all the flint you put in your bags I'm afraid only three flakes turned out to be archaeological. The rest of it was either natural frost shattered material or plough struck material and not worked flints. But we had three very nice retouched flints. We had this lovely little retouched bladelet, which may have been worked into a little fabricator tool. Um, and this is a technology that is characteristic of the Mesolithic period, so between 10,000 and 4,000 BC. The, um, that one came from test pit six um, on the higher ground in the middle of the park. And then we had these two retouched flakes that um, are more characteristic of Bronze Age technology. So sort of 2600 to 700 BC. One came from the middle one came from test pit 13 in the middle of the lower area in the middle of the park. And the this one came from. Oh, it should say test bit 22. I've forgotten to change the title when I. Um, this one came from test bit 22, which is actually next to test bit six. So these have been retouched. And what I mean by retouched is that they've been struck off the flake core, the flint core, and then they've had extra work done on them to start turning them into a usable tool. So it's a bit unclear whether they are tools, but with this one particularly. Um, on the right might be the startings of a nice little thumbnail scraper, for instance. So, so these are flints that have been worked into or started to be worked into something usable. But as there's only three flints, two from the Bronze Age, one from the Mesolithic period, they don't give us any indication that there is any habitation within the actual park itself. What these are is a background scatter of worked flint that represents use of the wider landscape and people moving through the landscape, but it doesn't mean that there is a prehistoric site within the park itself. 
and certainly in the Mesolithic period and probably in the Bronze Age, this is people moving through areas that are probably quite heavily wooded. And either these are casual droppings of flints, um, work flints and, you know, deliberate discard of something that hasn't worked out or something like that. Effectively, these are your Swiss army knives of the prehistoric period. A lump of flint is your Swiss army knife in that you can strike flints off and work them into pretty much any tool you need there and then. So you can basically, as long as you've got a good flint and a knowledge of how to turn it into different tools, you can do pretty much every job you need to do. And you can do it on the fly effectively as you're moving through the landscape. You can have a bit, a chunk of flint in a pouch uh, and just pull it out uh, and turn it into something. And actually, a flint flake is razor sharp when you strike that off. So you don't need to turn it into anything else to use it as a knife, for instance. It will instantly cut anything. Actually, the retouching is usually to try and blunt the edges into something or perhaps scrape without cutting or something like that, or make it narrow so it can pierce through something. So this is just a sort of background scatter of, of finds of people using the area. We also recovered a small assemblage of Roman pottery from six test pits. So test pits 5, 16, 18, 19, 20 and 22. Um, it was generally only found in one or two sherds in each of these test pits. The bulk of it is greyware, um, which is sort of common throughout the Roman period, uh, with one bit from test pit 16, one bit of colour coated ware, probably Neen Valley colour coated ware from the, what it's quite thin bodied. So it's probably off a beaker or, or something. Um, these are all very small. You can see by the, the 50 millimeter scale bar at the bottom. These are all tiny. They're all sort of like centimeter size. They're all very worn edges and they look like they've been circulating in the soil for a very long period of time. When you look at their distribution, though, they seem to actually all cluster in the southern half of the park. None of the northern test pits produced any Roman pottery. But we did put more test pits into the southern part of the park, so that might have biased it slightly. And we're only finding one or two sherds in each test pit. And generally, it feels more like it's arable manuring, manuring in cultivated fields rather than it being an occupation site. There's, again, no indication. There's no concentration of test pits producing this material or a cluster of finds from one particular test pit to suggest we're actually close to an occupation site of the Roman period. Indeed, the Roman period around Blaby is pretty poorly understood. We know that the Lutterworth Road is hypothesised to be the line of the Tripontium Road, so the road from Roman Leicester down to the Roman town of Tripontium on the Warwickshire border. But other than that, a fourth century coin has been found in a property off Wigston Road, and more recently a gully with, which has produced quite a lot of second century pottery has been found during the recent work at Blaby Hall Farm. But other than that, there's there's no real known Roman sites at all in the immediate area around Bowskill Park. Uh, and so the new material added from the park dig is just sort of adding to this feel that it, this is open countryside under under cultivation, under arable cultivation. And uh, as yet, we haven't identified a Roman occupation site. I mean, it's possible that the clustering a pot on the south side might mean that there might be a power site to the south of the park but that's it's an unknown quantity at the minute it, it would need exploration beyond the park boundaries to actually be able to explore that idea the anglo-saxon period so that post-roman period from the fifth century to the early ninth century is also a complete unknown in the park which is not unsurprising we wouldn't really expect to have found any sites or, or material from sites perhaps from this period um, so at the minute, this area remains an unknown quantity, basically. It remains a question mark. Our story picks up again then in the Saxo-Norman period. So this is the period, sort of the latter half of the 9th century through to um, the 11th, the end of the 11th century. So this is where we start getting some documentary references to Blaby as a village. So we know that Blaby, spelt Blady in 1086, is a Scandinavian place name meaning Blair's farmstead, which suggests that the settlement itself, the village, um, originated after the Vikings conquered Leicestershire in the late 9th century AD. So that it's a late 9th century village, a foundation effectively. 
Um, it, reigns, it remains Anglo-Scandinavian, for want of a, a better word, um, until the 11th century, the mid 11th century, and then in 1066, um, the land is forfeited from its Anglo-Scandinavian landowners and William I grants the village to Robert Count of Moulin, who later becomes the first Earl of Leicester. And it's actually held by a, a follower of Count Roberts called Norman, which I keep mentally thinking it's Norman the Norman, um, which is why I don't put it on the text. But um, anyway, when you look at the topography of the village, when you look at historic maps and, and sort of where the historic core of the village is, to me, it feels like the, the village has always been where it the sort of currently is, where the historic core currently is, as a nucleated settlement focused around the green to the north of the church. And in the Doomsday Book, we can infer from the number of people mentioned in the Doomsday Book that it probably had in 1086 around about 37 households. So we're looking at sort of a population of perhaps 150 to 200 people. So away from Bowskull Park. So to me, it would seem like there's no reason for there to be Saxo-Norman occupation within the park. And actually the results of the test pitting sort of bore that out. So we did find some Saxo-Norman pottery. We found, had a small assemblage, nine sherds of St. Neots ware and Stamford ware come out of some of the test pits. As you can see from this map, it's a really only one sherd per pit where it was found, and it's a broad scatter across the whole of the park. Again, all of these sherds were tiny and very worn and like the Roman pottery, it feels like they're manuring scatters in cultivated fields. Um, and now we can start bringing in the, uh, the geophysical information and the LIDAR information to start reconstructing what this landscape might look like. So the easy bit to reconstruct is the eastern half of the park where we've still got the surviving ridge and furrow from the medieval plough systems. So those are divided into two fields, field one and field two. Field one, the ridge and furrow goes east to west and in field two it goes north to south, indicating that there is a change in the system of, of ploughing, hence the two fields. They then look like they perhaps have a headland trackway running down the west side of those fields, which carries on north of the park and projects straight towards the village and the, and the church. And then to the west of that possible trackway, the geophysical survey and the LIDAR both suggest that there is other ridge and furrow on an east-west alignment. So what I've dubbed field three on this plan. So certainly my feeling is from the Roman period up to the 11th century, possibly the 12th century, um, the park area is under arable cultivation in, and certainly by the Saxo-Norman period, so sort of by from the 10th, 11th century, it is divided into these three different plough systems that we can we can see on this image. So the earthworks survive because of the way it's ploughing. So medieval ploughing is uses a single bladed or an asymmetric plough, which means that you're always casting the soil up on one side rather than distributing it evenly on both sides of the plough. And because of the fact that you're playing with big teams of oxen means that you've got a very um, big turning circle. You always plow in a sort of loop on one furrow, which ends up piling all the soil into the middle, creating this linear mound. And then you start the next one and, and so on. And it, each of these ridges represents a strip of land owned by um, a villager within the communal field system. So that would be their crop and the furrow acts as drainage between each farmer's individual strip of land. So because it's a communal farming system, all of these strips within the field would have the same crop on each year, but each strip would be managed and looked after by the individual farmer or, or villager who held that strip, which is why you end up the way it's ploughed. Now, the reason we can distinguish between what I've been calling arable manuring scatters and what we could call domestic assemblages and um, occupation assemblages is a number of characteristics. And I've pulled these two test bits out as good examples. So on the left, we've got 
the medieval pottery from test bit 12, which is in the northeast corner of the park in field one. And what you can see here is there's only two, four, six, eight, ten sherds of medieval pottery that's come out of this test pit. It's all very small sort of centimetre or sub centimetre sized sherds, which are all very worn, which suggests that they've been moving around in the soil for a long period of time. So they've been moved around by cultivation, perhaps the plough turning the soil over and eroding and breaking them down. In contrast, on the right, you've got the medieval, well, actually only half the medieval pottery from test bit six, which is in enclosure four. Now, this is a much greater quantity. And whilst it's quite a mixed in terms of size, in general, the sherds are much larger and sharper edged. And we've got things like we've got pot rims surviving. We, we've got bits of glaze still surviving on sherds as well. This is an assemblage that hasn't moved very far or very much after it was originally discarded and dumped. So this is a refuse dump that is probably very close to an occupation site. So it's this quantity and quality of the sherds that we're making this judgment on what type of activity they represent. And, but when we get into this high medieval period, we can see a quite marked change in the activity within the park area. So the, this, so this is sometime in the 12th or 13th century, this change occurs. We can see on the Eastern side of the park, field one and field two remain under arable cultivation by the looks of it. Very little pottery was found in these, in the test bit 12 is the one I was just talking about. Field three, though, appears to have been divided in the 12th or 13th century into these enclosures, potentially six that perhaps form long linear strips ex extending back from the road to the um, to the west, so that's Sycamore Street and Welford Road to the west of the park. Now, particularly in enclosure one, so it was test pit nine, and enclosure four, which was test pits um, six and 22. These produce the largest assemblages of medieval pottery in the park, almost 100 sherds from each test bit effectively. And these seem to be characteristic of refuse dumps, of middens. So suggesting activity is going on somewhere close by. And then we've also got finds and archaeological features from the southwest corner of the park in what I've called enclosures five and six which again could suggest occupation because we've got finds associated with cobbled surfaces and walls potentially. Now, these could be interpreted in a number of different ways. So the, in, off the first sort of interpretation, you could say these are the toffs and crofts of linear medieval settlement extending south along this road to the west of the park. And if that is the case, then I would suggest that the house sites themselves, the message sites with the cottages and outhouses are probably to the west of the stream along the street frontage. And that the land inside the park to the east stream represents the backyard garden areas and paddocks and pastures that are associated with, but behind those house sites. And so, this midden in enclosure one is perhaps the compost heap and rubbish dump at the end of the garden associated with a house that would have actually fronted onto the street further to the west. And the same enclosure four might be at the back of a property, again, fronting onto and including enclosure five and in fronting onto the street. The other possibility, and this is down to the fact that we just don't have enough information at this point based on what we've done. The other possibility is we could be looking at perhaps an occupation site in the southwest corner of the park where the cobbled surfaces and possible walls was discovered and that the other enclosures and with their midden heaps all represent activity and refuse being dumped from this site in the southwest corner and that they sort of represent the fields and paddocks sort of the home fields perhaps around a small farmstead. So this is where one meter square test bits recovering frames doesn't sort of take us far enough in answering this question. What we can say, though, is that there is definitely medieval activity of 12th to 14th century date within the park area, that the earthworks are definitely part of some sort of medieval village like activity. It's not open field anymore. So what I mean by midden assemblages is again, so this is the pottery from or the finds from test pit nine 
in enclosure one, what I've, I'm sort of saying is characteristic of a midden assemblage. So we've got a large assemblage of broken medieval pottery. And again, we've got large crisp sherds suggesting they haven't moved very far. We've got pot rims surviving. We've got evidence of pots with sooting on the exterior. So we've got evidence of cooking pots. So we've got this sort of domestic assemblage of pottery. But other finds from the test pit, a small quantity of animal bones, some iron nails, and a broken iron knife blade. Again, they're all the sort of things that you might discard on a refuse heap at the bottom of the garden. So you've got this mixed assemblage of domestic refuse here that is all probably of medieval date. Um, so the animal bone and the ironwork isn't necessarily at, characteristically datable, but in association with the medieval pottery, I think it's fair to say that all of this material is medieval in origin. So the pottery itself, it was overwhelmingly the pottery we recovered, it was overwhelmingly potter's Marston ware. So 87% of the assemblage of 449 sherds of medieval pottery was potter's Marston ware. That's not surprising given the period that we have and that because the potter's Marston kilns are only four miles west of Blavey, so that they are the immediate and local pottery source. Of the other material, we had 10% um, of the assemblage was several different types of Chilvers Coton ware. So Chilvers Coton is near Nuneaton, just over the Warwickshire border. That's again not surprising because Chilvers Coton ware came to replace Potter's Marston ware in the later um, sort of high medieval period. So in the sort of 14th century, the industry started to replace the Potter's Marston industry. Um, effectively, it was because Potter's Marston pottery is charcoal fired and Chilvers Coton pottery is coal fired and so it's much higher temperatures making a much better quality of pot and so basically um, it came to supersede the potter's master industry. There was also a tiny little assemblage of Shelley wares that all probably lived in Stanion ware and lived in Stanion ware is the next um, closest pottery um, kiln site to um, Blaby which is just over the border in Northamptonshire. So the assemblage we've got is very characteristic of um, medieval assemblages on the, in the southern sort of area of Leicestershire. And the bulk of the material is cooking pots, so storage jars, cooking pots and jar and jugs, sort of kitchen wares. And we can tell that because they're all sort of large storage vessels. Some of them have got sooting on the exterior showing they've been used as cooking pots. But there was a small assemblage, particularly um, the Chilvers Coton ware of glazed sherds, including and, and the one example I've included here of a glazed shirt that came from test pit five is a very nice um, rim of a jug, a, a big drinking jug that would have been glazed. So would have been tableware rather than um, kitchenware, because in this instance, the glaze is on the exterior. So it's decorative rather than a practical glaze. Um, so the assemblage really rules out the idea that these earthworks are the original medieval manor site in Blaby. There is not enough high status pottery wares coming out of these test bits to suggest that there is anything more than peasant farmstead or cottage in, in the area of the park. So an area of medieval Blaby village, yes, but not a manorial site. The archaeology in the southwest corner then, in test pit five, there was they excavated a pebbled surface immediately beneath the topsoil, then went through some more subsoil and then came down onto what may have been another disturbed surface and beneath it a linear feature packed with stone which may be the remains of a wall. Um, we say maybe because it was right on the edge of the trench we didn't see the full feature and so it could turn out to be something else but it looked like it was probably going to be the remains of a wall footing and um, so, so the foundation of a wall perhaps. Those archaeological features all produced just medieval finds and so these features really have a, the earliest they can be really is the 13th century, these features. That's the same for Test Bit 7, not too far away, which came down onto a thick cobbled surface which actually had multiple phases of surfacing, so as a surface that had, had new surfaces added to it. And again, the pebbles themselves, when we removed them, produced a small quantity of pottery that says they can't be earlier than the 13th century. So it's looking like, coupled with the other archaeological features that have been seen in the area when the paths went in, in the southwest corner of the park, we've got quite an expansive area of perhaps yard surface um, with various walls that could be building walls, but could equally perhaps be um, field walls and enclosure walls. 
without digging a wider area, it, it's impossible to say at this minute. But we can say that it is definitely medieval archaeology of, sort of 13th century date in the southwest corner of the park. That isn't just farmland, it is actual an occupation site of some sort. So this then leads us to sort of perhaps theorise or, or put forward two possible theories to how this then fits in with Blaby itself. So we've got the original Blaby village perhaps to the north of the church focused around the green. That starts to grow up in the late 9th century and perhaps by the 13th century the population is starting to become too big for that quite nucleated and tight cluster of cottages. And so new planned settlement expansion is needed. It's a familiar story. We, of course, are experiencing that all the time today as well. And it might be then that the archaeology in Bow School Park represents some sort of linear, linear expansion of the village down the road to the west of the park. So down this sort of Sycamore Street, Welford Road line, um, with perhaps a whole series of rows of cottages coming down this line with their backyards stretching away and so we've got an instance here where arable fields have had actually had to be taken out of cultivation and turned into new domestic properties, perhaps. The other possibility, though, is that we are actually looking at some sort of dispersed settlement. So perhaps something that is actually away from the village core, like a farmstead that's out in its own countryside, surrounded by its own fields. At the minute, we can't be more precise than this. We can put forward these two theories, but this is something that would need to be tested in, in different ways going forward if we wanted a more definitive answer on this. What is clear, though, is that this occupation was relatively short-lived. So it probably appears in the 13th century, and by the end of the 14th century, it was gone. So it's sort of, I mean, it's still around for 100, maybe 200 years or so, but it isn't long lasting. And we can see that in the absolute lack of late medieval pottery from the park. So this plan, again, it goes back to showing us the distribution of the high medieval pottery, the 12th to 14th century pottery. And we go to the late medieval, so the 15th to mid 16th century, and there's just one shirt of Midland purple where came out a test bit 16. No other test pits produced any late medieval pottery at all. It's, it's quite a stark contrast. And this then would suggest that this activity had ceased and been abandoned by the beginning of the 15th century, perhaps even by um, so sort of like 1375, even before the end of the 14th century. Now, that's not uncommon. That's quite characteristic of medieval villages across England during this period. Um, so sort of through the 12th, 13th centuries, you see economic boom in the rural countryside, uh, followed by population growth with villages expanding rapidly beyond their traditional nucleated cores. But then through the 14th century, you hit a whole series of famines and plagues, um, most famously the Black Death in the middle of the, the century, that have catastrophic consequences for areas of villages. So you get some villages that are completely depopulated, but you also get others that um, these dispersed sites become abandoned or areas become abandoned. And that seems to be the case here. Whatever the activity was going on in the park, all activity seems to have ceased. Habitation and occupation seems to have ceased by the end of the 14th century. And then going into the 15th century, it actually then became more profitable for landowners to not um, find new tenants for those abandoned properties, but actually to turn these sites into pasture for, um, for mostly for sheep farming, because the sheep, the wool from the sheep was actually more profitable than the tenants effectively. And so it certainly looks like from the end of the 14th century onwards, the park becomes permanent grassland, which is why we didn't really find too many um, later finds after the medieval period is because with the grassland there's no need to manure it um, with pottery. The reason that pottery ends up in cultivated fields is especially in this area which is clay rich um, is that the pottery actually helps break up the soil. Having these um, intrusions, these pottery intrusions in the clay, especially in the winter when you plow it, the clay will fracture, the soil, heavy soils will fracture along the inclusions in it, the pottery and stones. And so actually putting pottery deliberately into the field is a good idea. 
in these areas. When it becomes grassland, though, there's no need to put that pottery in that domestic way. So you don't need to manure the um, fields with your um, compost heap. So that will stay in your garden areas. What you, I mean, effectively, the fields are self-manuring by the, the sheep that are on them or the cattle that are on them. So when we go beyond the medieval period, then into the post-medieval period, so the mid 16th century through to the beginning of the 19th century, um, again, very little has turned up in terms of fines. There was a scatter of um, post-medieval pottery, mostly um, black glazed earthenware or what we'd call panchenware, um, and with a smaller assemblage of Staffordshire manganese mottled ware and, and, a, and a little bit of Midland blackware, and a sort of very typical characteristic post-medieval um, pottery assemblage, but just not in huge quantities. It's consistent again with sort of perhaps casual losses in the fields um, of drinking cups and bowls and things rather than it being deliberate discard of domestic waste. It's certainly not in the quantity you'd expect to see if there was actually habitation going on in this area. But what we do get and what we found in test bits 4, 8 and 13 in this low area in the middle of the park is that all of those test bits were dug into a soil that was not was completely different to the topsoils and subsoils seen in the other test bits. What it was beneath the topsoil, what the clay that was or the soil that was being dug out, which was horrendous and, and to sort of dig and sieve, was a sort of reworked mixture of topsoil, subsoil, and natural clay, all sort of mixed together as if it was backfilling some sort of large intrusion into this area. And this corresponds with the geophysical survey, which also shows in the same area, as you sort of can see all this uneven ground on the LIDAR survey as well, that the ground in this area is extensively disturbed. And what this probably is then is a clay pit, given the fact that the soil backfill was also full of sort of hundreds of sherds of broken bricks, which all looked like they were sort of homemade, uh, you know, homemade, not fat, modern factory made bricks, but mostly homemade bricks. Um, I would suggest, given that we know the natural in the area is a nice red clay, that this is a clay pit for local brick production, which when we go back to the 1766 enclosure map, it could be then that this central lower enclosure is Brick Hill Close that is mentioned in the act of enclosure. The clue might be there. The fact it's called being Brick Hill Close within these areas of enclosures might be the clue we were looking for to what this um, disturbance actually is. Now, there's no real other record as far as I know of a brick pit or brickworks in this area. But you, I suspect this is a sort of local industry. I mean, it could just be digging out clay to make bricks for the hall and the farm buildings, the home farm for Blaby Hall itself. All of them are brick built. So it could be some sort of, you know, short lived, very localised production. But we can also suggest that perhaps the clay was being extracted and taken out of the sunken trackway on the north side of the park. Now, the sunken trackway itself probably originated in the medieval period. So it's this long linear sunken hollow way that you see on the, on the north side of the park. Now, this was probably originally created in the medieval period as access between the road on the west side of the park and that sort of headland trackway along the edge of the fields, which would have acted as an alleyway along the backs of the properties if there were medieval toffs and crofts in the park. But the excavators who dug the test pit in the bottom of the sunken trackway came down onto, and again, a cobbled surface. But this doesn't appear to have been a medieval cobbled surface. This looks more likely, does it contain brick rubble, to have been put down in the post-medieval period. So it might well be that the brick carts um, or the clay wagons um, that are removing material from the clay pit are using this sunken trackway and it has been resurfaced with cobbles to reinforce the track bed and some of that brick waste has ended up in it as well. So it looks like the cobbled surface at the base of the trackway, and it does look like there is a cobbled surface, is probably linked with the clay pit rather than the earlier medieval activity. And the fines were again the post medieval fines did sort of come with us uh, sort of from a scatter around if you if there is any sort of um, pattern to the assemblage of the post medieval fines they do come from a sort of scatter around the brick pit area and the sunken trackway 
and they include a very small assemblage of broken clay tobacco pipe fragments, as well as, um, as I said, some black glazed earthenware, so panchionware, and Staffordshire manganese mottled ware, which is sort of commonly used in, in mugs, or coffee mugs, effectively. Um, there wasn't the sort of diversity of finds in the post-medieval period to, from the park to suggest again that this was domestic waste coming from elsewhere in the village or a site within the park. It seems to be perhaps casual losses within the area again. Um, same with the um, prehistoric finds representing that sort of background scatter of activity in the park. So we have come to a resolution, I think, um, for why the middle of the park is so much lower than the rest of the park. It is a local brick making site. So, and that's not just that that we found resolution for. To sort of sum up sort of these final thoughts then on what we've managed to achieve with just 22 one meter square pits across the park is we've identified that people have been using the area of around the park for more than 6,000 years. Um, we can sort of suggest now quite reasonably that through the Roman period and into the sort of Saxon Norman period, so into the 12th century, early 13th century, the park area was arable farmland, so it was under cultivation. Um, but Saxo Norman pottery coming from the park, whilst it doesn't show activity occupation within the park, is consistent with settlement in Blaby dating to the late, late 9th century. Um, so that sort of helps support the idea of sort of the foundation date for the village in, in the wider village. Um, in the 12th and 13th century, we've probably got most likely the 13th century, we've got these evidence for these backyards of either rows of properties fronting onto the street to the west of the park or fields surrounding a farmstead covering that sort of western half of the park whilst the eastern half of the park remained under arable cultivation. All occupation and arable cultivation ceased in the park before the 15th century and the area became permanent pasture. We've now got evidence, as I just said, of a clay pit for local brick production being dug in the centre of the park in the late 17th or early 18th century. So the terraces and lower areas are not the remains of an, a previous landscape garden for Blaby Hall. But they are the remains of that brick pit. And then the area became parkland, was taken out as sort of pastoral roles and became this parkland in the mid 19th century. Although parks actually, of course, would have still retained a pastoral role because being able to look out from your garden over a small herd of deer or some very select um, um, sheep that you, you keep in your park to keep your grass down is actually a, a nice pastoral scenic scene that you can look at and, and enjoy. So the parkland in the Victorian period probably wouldn't have been as neat and manicured as it is today or regularly mowed. It would have had um, sheep in it probably keeping the grass down or perhaps some cows. So if anyone out there wants to take this story to the next step and this goes beyond this project. Um, if anyone did want to explore the medieval activity in the southwest corner of the park further, then really we've done what we can with test fitting in the park generally, I feel. Uh, maybe there could be a scatter of test pits put into some of the areas where we haven't put test pits, but those areas are likely to be sort of fairly uninteresting and fines free anyway. They're going to be in areas of field that we can already recognize as field and so the sort of digging the test pit is a little meaningless but if you did want to do more stuff in the park then sort of really the way to do it would be to dig some larger areas in the southwest corner of the park to try and get a better idea of what the things like the cobbled surfaces and the walls actually are which could only be actually explored through a larger excavation than a one meter square so you'd sort of perhaps need to do a longer trench or a sort of like a five by five meter square area perhaps to fully sort of better understand these these archaeological features. Um, and then if you wanted to go further than that and actually start exploring these themes um, within Blaby itself and how they actually impact on the story of Blaby as a village, well the best thing to do is to start encouraging all the house owners in Blaby to allow you to dig test bits in their gardens. Um, which really would be a new project, I suspect, um, if anyone is looking for a project. Um, but yeah, really, so you need to take the story of the park the next step. You now need to start actually looking at beyond the park, effectively, 
to understand that, that wider landscape and how the park and what's going on in the park interacts with the things outside it. Which is where I'll leave you to mull over whether you are, have the energy, Gemma, to put together another project. So it just leaves me to say thank you very much to all our volunteers. You are fantastic and we couldn't have done this without you. Um, so thank you very much indeed and to everybody else involved in the project. And as I said at the beginning, if you want to find out more about what was actually found in your individual test bits and read in more, much more detail what I've just taken you through, there is the project website. 